different pods of orcas actually have different dialects. So the same as, you know, we speak English and Australians speak English, but Australians sound super funny. A certain pod of orcas will have its own dialect and they are able to cross communicate, but they can also distinguish each other very, very clearly, just audibly. I'm wildlife biologist Forrest Galante, and this is The Breakdown. This is Free Willy. In this day and age, I don't think we'd ever even consider making a positive movie about orcas in captivity, and that's because we've learned so much about them. We understand that these animals are highly intelligent now. Yeah, what do you want? Let's play that again. Right here, what you're seeing is the intelligence of an orca express. He's actually pushing the Coke bottles towards the young kid to show him that he wants to play, or I'm not sure what he's indicating, but this is a sign of incredible mammalian intelligence. That being said, in this same exact frame, you can see the bent over dorsal fin. When we see orcas in the wild, we see it straight up. It means they're happy, they're healthy, they're not under stress. Once they get captured and put into captivity, they bend down like that, and we've learned that that is a result of them being very fatigued and emotionally upset. Once the animal has been in captivity and its dorsal fin is curled down, it will never erect again. Even if the animal's freed, it's relocated back into the wild, it will never again go straight. So this is a physiological form of emotional torture that you're seeing exhibited as a characteristic. Like all fins, the dorsal fin is used for stabilization, thrust, and swimming. When it's straight up and down, obviously it's gonna help the animal be more aquadynamic, slice through the waves, and when it's curled over, it's gonna be a bit of a problem for it. You know what's amazing about this movie compared to many other wildlife movies is there's nothing to say how real is this or isn't it because it is real. They are using a real animal, a real very well trained animal and you're seeing it express real characteristics. It's quite beautiful in helping us understand these animals even if they shouldn't have been in that situation. Get out of here. Go. there for a second. It may be that in this scene, the blowhole was exhibited in the sense of like, you'd let out a sigh and be like, ugh, but that's not what's going on. Whales don't do that. And I bet whoever was directing this movie when that happened, he was like, yes, that was perfect. The whale just sighed, but the whale didn't sigh. It was just taking a normal breath. Us as humans, we anthropomorphize that and start to feel it as though it's a characteristic that we would exhibit. pause it there. So one thing that's really interesting that I think most people don't realize is the dexterity of these large mammals. This is a huge marine mammal. It has no fingers and toes. It doesn't have the ability to dissect things the way we do as primates with our fingers. But instead, it has the ability to do that with its mouth. It can carry that tiny little piece of paracord that's connecting the two Coke bottles. Orcas, when hunting, say like in South Africa when they chased off all the great white sharks, they're so precise with using their mouth and teeth that they were able to just take the livers out of the sharks that they were hunting and leave the rest of the animal because they wanted the iron that was in the livers. So it's amazing. We don't think that this big, goofy looking mouth could be used so delicately, but it's actually a very precise tool. Quit it. In this scene, what we see is Willie blowing water at Jesse like he wants to play, and that's actually what he's doing. The animal is so intelligent that we don't have to anthropomorphize characteristics on him. We know that that is actually what he wants, which is to play. In this case, it's a trained animal for the movie, but if it were to do that, say to its keeper, it's probably because the animal wants something or it wants to play, and that is incredible. To be able to tie an action to a result, in other words, spit water and I get play out of it, amazing sign of intelligence. See now what's beautiful about this is what you're hearing on screen is actual whale projection. People have been able to record what whales sound like by putting microphones down into the ocean and that's what they're playing. They're playing actual whale calls, which is a lovely thing to hear. But what they're depicting is the fact that Willie in captivity through some kind of wall or barrier is talking to his family out in the ocean. It's your family. Now, whether or not orcas can communicate above water, I'm actually not sure. These are animals that have evolved to live in the ocean, and we know that sound travels at a much greater rate in water than it does in air. As far as sticking your head up into the air and communicating to a pod of orca that's out in the ocean, that seems a little more far-fetched to me. Relatively new science 
has actually shown that they can also distinguish each other very, very clearly just audibly. So in this case, Willie is communicating with his pod outside and they know straight away that it's him. It's not just like somebody being like, hey buddy, and the other guy being like, hey, I hear ya. You know, they know exactly who they are. It's like if you're yelling to your mom across the house, she knows who it is that's yelling to her and that's the situation that's going on right here. This is Ace Ventura 2, When Nature Calls. Friends, rodents, quadrupeds, Lend me your ears! <laughs> These Jim Carrey movies are so stupid. Oh! Jim Carrey calls all the animals, and all of a sudden, the hunter in his hunting lodge is looking around. And first, he sees a lion, and then you hear in the background an accurate African lion roar. And then he sees a zebra, and sure enough, you hear the zebra in the background. They've actually sunk up real animal sounds with the stuffed animal to make it seem as though these mounted creatures are coming to life. <laughs> Freeze this frame. We're splitting hairs at this point, right? But we know that Ace Ventura is in Africa, and you've got an African elephant mounted on the wall, and yet, what comes bashing through the wall? It's an Indian elephant. You can see here the African elephant has got these big, huge ears, and the Indian elephant's got these little small ears. Indian elephants are much smaller. They have a much different shape of their head. Their trunks are different. They don't have tusks anywhere near like an African elephant. I mean, they're really two very different looking animals. And it makes sense because Indian elephants are much more trainable. They're the kinds that you typically see in circuses. They're much more receptive to behavior modification than your big African elephants. And behind that is a macaw from the Amazon. So although we're in Africa, the first two animals Animals we see bash into the room are not native to the African continent at all. And behind the macaw, we've got pigeons. Is that a horse I'm seeing at random in front of the zebra? Yep, we just got a horse here. I mean, we got a real mix of animals here. What the people making this film have done just said, get me all the trained animals that we can and let's put them all together in a room. You know, how many biologist nerds like Forrest are gonna actually watch this and pick it apart and say, oh, these animals don't occur in Africa. This is ridiculous. The opening scene of Ace Ventura 1 is a whole bunch of animals working together as he hides them in his apartment. Here we are, I think, in the closing scene, basically, of the second film. And we've got all these animals working together. <laughs> Here. What you're seeing here is the elephant rears up is not a typical aggressive elephant behavior, right? For an elephant to rear up, it's exposing its underside, which is giving it a vulnerable point. If an elephant is really aggressive, what it's gonna do is put its head down and charge and trample you low to the ground or push you into the ground using their head or their trunk. What you're seeing instead is kind of like that circus elephant behavior, right? Where they rear up, they play with the bull. It's kind of a playful behavior. But if you're a six foot tall human being and an 18 foot tall elephant rears up, it's very intimidating feeling and that's the image they're going for here. I would never classify an elephant as aggressive, right? They're protective, they can be very territorial, and they can certainly express aggression towards humans, but an elephant, like most animals, if you leave it alone, it's gonna leave you alone. Hold that there for a second. So vultures don't swoop in and attack things. They're carrion eaters, they eat dead things. So instead, this animal is literally just coming in for a landing, right? And its keeper's probably right off camera like this, and it landed right on his arm. <laughs> I got a chip smoke this car. Cost drunk. Hilarious. You see, humans and animals can live in harmony. In comes Ace Ventura riding an ostrich, right? I grew up in Zimbabwe, which is where ostriches are native. And in fact, my neighbors had an ostrich farm. So I spent a lot of time riding ostriches as a kid. As an adult man, it's pretty hard to ride an ostrich. You have to kind of do exactly what he's doing and be way back and you just kind of fall off uh, after a very short amount of time. But as a little kid, when you weigh like 60 or 70 pounds, you can actually stay on the ostriches for a lot of time and it's a lot of fun. Ostriches don't really like it. They're not made to be ridden, they're birds. Does it totally negatively affect them? No, but should you go riding ostriches here and there? No, it's, no, it's not good for them. Say hello no, to scum. my <laughs> stinky little friend. Oh! Now, it's not realistic, but the idea that you could just have this weaponized skunk that you cuddle like your lap cat and then pull up his tail and he just rockets stink spray all over you is absolutely hilarious. Not how it works, but absolutely hilarious. Skunks obviously use that as a defense mechanism when they're threatened. If the skunk is hanging out in your lap, it's clearly not very threatened, so it's not just gonna spray on command. 
when he blows like the barrel of the gun, the barrel of skunk, and it like twitches a little bit. I don't know how they got that. It's so funny. This is a uh, Christmas classic, Elf. I think he's walking through Central Park here, if I remember correctly, and sure enough, he comes up on a very fat, very healthy raccoon. Hey, what's your name? Should you be seeing a raccoon out in a very snowy environment like that in the middle of the day? Probably not. Now, that being said, he's in New York, right? He's in Central Park. In New York City, the raccoons will climb up the sides of skyscrapers and sleep in the tops of tall buildings where the heating units are. So they actually tend to be really active all year long. So your odds of encountering a raccoon in Central Park, even in the winter, it could definitely happen. Raccoons are nocturnal. They're mostly active at night, but they're pretty crepuscular, meaning they're pretty active at dawn and dusk as well. So are you gonna see them just out foraging in the middle of the day? No, it's less likely. That's when predators are out. That's when it's scary. But keep in mind, these are city raccoons, right? They don't exhibit normal behavior. They could easily be out foraging in the middle of the day. My name's Buddy. Hold that there for a second. Look at that thing. I think a lot of people in North America don't realize how cute our own animals are, right? We're like looking at like these exotic elephants and lions and tigers. Look at that face. Nowhere has a raccoon like that. That thing's freaking adorable. Let's see what happens. My name's Buddy. <laughs> so, hold on, let's back up there for a second. Here he is, he's all cute, right? He's cuddly, he's got a sweet little smile. And then all of a sudden he starts to back up, right? So that's good, that's body language to suggest that this raccoon is nervous of whatever is in front of it. All of a sudden he just goes into this little like demon raccoon face, which I think is still adorable. Maybe I shouldn't, maybe I'm sick in the head. Is this a real raccoon in this exact moment? Yes but it's a real taxidermied one or it's a real stuffed one that's been made to look snarly and growly. That cute little cuddly trained raccoon is definitely not making this face that you're seeing in this scene. And they just inserted that one shot. If you chased a raccoon into a corner of an alley, he would just run up over the fence or run through your legs. If he was completely out of options, stuck in a cage or stuck in a trash can or something like that, that's when you might see this super aggressive looking body language. Oh. Does someone need a hug? So pro tip, don't hug raccoons for fun in Central Park. I'm guessing how they got that shot is they took a stuffed raccoon or raccoon toy and literally threw it at Will Ferrell's neck and had him fall backwards and it's hilarious. Is that how a raccoon would jump up and attack? I guess, but in Central Park it would much rather just turn and run away. We've got 101 Dalmatians. Dogs bark, you know, for a number of reasons, to sound an alarm, to communicate, to call. In this case, he's barking to reach another dog. So what we're seeing now is like this game of doggy telephone. The Dalmatian barks first, and then it hits the dog on the barge, and now it's hitting the dog in the alley, and I assume it's going to continue passing the message on to get across the city, it seems. That's not really how dog barking works, right? A dog barks at another dog, and the dog barks back. A dog can bark for hunger, it can bark because it's sad. You know, there's a lot of reasons that dogs make noise. But when they're all together, and the sound is kind of traveling from dog to dog, it's because they're all getting each other excited, typically. <laughs> All right, anybody who's ever been on a farm knows that's not really how it works, right? The dog doesn't tell the horse to tell the pig something. Can the horses or the donkeys or the pigs sense when the dogs are super excited or sad or being punished? Totally. There's no simple answer to do animals communicate. You know, sheep dogs work with sheep. Cattle dogs work with cows. You know, there's certain hunting dogs that work alongside horses. These are two different species that work together. It doesn't mean that they're family. It doesn't mean that they're best friends. It just means they know how to respect one another. Say a cattle dog that rides along a cowboy's horse, right? That dog knows that he's in charge of the cows, but he's still commanded by the person on the horse. So there's a chain of command that gets developed. This interspecies relationship, although initiated by man, happens in the wild too. There was very recently a really cool viral video of a badger and a coyote going through a tunnel in San Francisco going to hunt together. Nobody taught them that. Those are just two animals in the wild that figured out how to work together. These relationships do develop with and without man, but not exactly like you're seeing it here. We've got jungle to jungle. 
So the first time I'd ever seen it was when I was a little Zimbabwean boy who had just come to the United States, and I'd come from my own jungle to jungle. So of all the movies that we're looking at, this is the one that I actually know the best, which is hilarious. Maybe don't move! He does have a big tarantula just walking on him, which looks very intimidating, but as we know from the pet trade, are pretty common animals that can be handled very comfortably. It's now coming after me! Damn, it's chasing me! What? Hold that there for a second. I have people all the time telling me these incredible fables of the snake or the spider that chased them. <laughs> you have never been chased by a spider. It has never come after you the way it's coming after Tim Allen in this film, right? They don't do that. The spider wants to have nothing to do with you. It wants to get away. Did it happen to run in your direction, possibly, as a means to escape? Sure. No, no, no. You can work with them just like this. This is, as weird as it sounds, a trained spider. Mimi, I think's the kid's name, kind of gently tapping the spider on the butt, goes into the basket, closes the basket. I believe that this kid actually did that. Whether he did or was a stunt double, I don't know, but that's what they're like. They're not big, scary, mean, aggressive animals. They're typically just pretty calm spiders. When tarantulas are agitated, they will shed their hairs because their hairs have a terrible irritant on them. And if they get in your eyes or they get in your mouth, if you're a predator like a bird trying to eat them, that becomes a big problem. Tarantulas basically have two forms of defense. One is to bite and the other is to shed their hairs. This is Life of Pi. Oh. So obviously these are CG animals, right? The tiger CG, the fish is CG, and at the end of the movie we kind of understand why. But this is very, very real behavior. In fact, of all the movies, this might be the most real behavior. Anybody that spent a lot of time fishing out at sea knows that you 100% do get flying fish that will fly right into the boat, hit people in the face. Now, it's typically happening at night. Flying fish are attracted to light. They migrate based on moonlight. Your boat light that's sitting up here like this, it kind of looks like moonlight, and the flying fish will fly full speed and pretty much kamikaze right into the side of boats. I've been hit in the chest, I've been hit in the side of the head. To have flying fish fly into you like that is a very realistic thing. Flying fish fly for a couple reasons. The main one is predator avoidance. So when they're startled, they take off and they put out their modified pectoral fins. They act like a wing and they let them glide over the surface. But they also use that as a means to migrate, to move vast distances across the sea. Here, it's yours. <laughs> I like the paper airplane rendition of the flying fish, right? You throw it, puts its pecs out, and flies off. Never tried it, don't think it would work, but you know, maybe. Uh. Play that again. This happens, this is a real thing. I mean, I don't know that it happens quite in that density that you're seeing it like that. You know, it's more like one here, one there but you totally get groups of flying fish nailing the side of the boat and landing in the boat just like this out at sea. Again, it's all CG, but it's still pretty realistic. That's what happens when a big school of fish congregate around a boat or out in the ocean. You get all this foaming water and it's just kind of chaos just like that. I'm Forrest Galante, and this has been my breakdown.